questions in the room, I'm going to start introductions. Uh, take my time, allow people to join the room as I work through this. So we're going to get started shortly. During this online presentation, we'll be discussing the shortened rapid ride J line route. We plan to shorten the route near the future U District Link Light Rail Station instead of previously planned near the Roosevelt Link Light Rail Station. The remainder of the route south of the University Bridge will remain the same. So for this meeting, we're focusing on the changes to the route in the University District and Roosevelt neighborhoods. We have some team members here tonight representing the Seattle Department of Transportation and King County Metro. We have Garth Marrow, who's the project manager. We have myself, Daryl Bormer. We have Joel Hancock from STAR. And we have Jerry Robertson, Robertson from King County Metro. We also have various other experts who we may call upon should the questions be tailored to them. And we also are joined tonight by uh, Tom Van Broncos from the Department of Neighborhoods, one of our partners. So any questions that may need to be directed to Tom, he can take those uh, in the first 40 minutes. If not, we can direct those questions to Tom and he can get back to us and we can place the answers on our website. So for us, the, those of you I can see still just joining us, all attendees are muted, but you will be able to submit questions throughout this presentation using the Q&A function. Questions will be moderated and our presenter will respond to as many as possible at the end. If we do not have enough time to address all the points raised, we will compile all the questions and answers in a single document and add that to the project webpage. We are recording this presentation so that it can be housed on the project website for all those who could not attend. To make this presentation the best possible for all, can you ensure you are muted and you've turned off your video camera? Uh, we are doing the same right now. Uh, we are going to begin with a pre-recorded presentation. After this presentation, we will turn on our cameras and address those questions that you can submit throughout this presentation. Remember, I can still see people joining, so I'm just going to give it a couple more minutes. Remember, you can submit questions, hover over your menu bar, you'll see a Q&A function. Click on that and you'll be able to submit questions. We'll get started in one or two minutes time with a short video explaining the project and the changes that are being made. And then about after that finishes, we will turn on our cameras and address questions at that point. Um, should we not be able to address them all tonight, we will certainly place all the answers to your questions online tomorrow or in the coming days. But this meeting is being recorded. so. One thing for sure is the video from this meeting will be online tomorrow on our project website, along with a copy of the slide. So if anyone gets cut off, has to leave, has any issues uh, with technology, it is being recorded and it will be available online so that not only you can recap or you can continue to ask questions to the project team, but you can also share with friends, colleagues, neighbors, family, anyone else you think should see this presentation. So I think we're starting to get a good number in the room. Perhaps we can turn on our video in a minute's time and get the event started. Okay, I think we're ready to hit play on the video. After this video plays, we will turn on our cameras and we will then start addressing the Q&As submitted. Hi, my name is Garth Merrill and I am the SDOT project manager for the Rapid Ride Roosevelt J-Line project. And I'd like to thank you for taking the time to learn more about the project with us today. This project is a partnership with King County Metro, as well as the Seattle Department of Neighborhoods and the Seattle Office of Economic Development. We also have the Federal Transit Administration that we are partnering with as we are seeking a Small Starts grant. 
I'll start by going the presentation by going through an overview of the project and kind of where things are at today. First, we'd like to start with why the Rapid Ride J Line project in the first place. Well, more people and more jobs are moving to Belltown, South Lake Union, East Lake, and the University District. The existing bus service cannot support this growth. During peak hours, 30% of the trips are running late, and over 60% are overcrowded. The Rapid Ride J Line will improve transit speed, reliability, overcrowding, and connections with features like bus only lanes, upgraded traffic signals, and additional trips. Improving transit will allow more people to travel to and within these neighborhoods. The Rapid Ride J Line is expected to increase tra transit ridership and provide an attractive alternative to driving alone. This is critical to meeting our climate change goals since transportation is the leading contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in Seattle. Additionally, the Rapid Ride J Line will improve safety for people walking and biking along the corridor by adding protected bike lanes, ADA ramps, and other pedestrian improvements. Between 2012 and 2017, there were 39 reported collisions involving people riding bicycles along East Lake Avenue East, most of which resulted in injury. And this project will help to address some of those safety concerns. As I noted, King County Metro is one of the key partner agencies for this. And the intent is to implement a rapid ride line. We certainly have a few rapid ride lines going through the city of Seattle right now, but wanted to just emphasize a couple of those key features that come along with rapid ride. It's convenient and easy to use. The goal is to have buses come so often you don't need to have a schedule. This includes upgrading stations, traffic signals, street improvements to allow you to move more and stop less as you're taking transit. We've done a lot of community engagement to get to this point on the project. Starting back in 2014, 2015, as we kind of started the project and all the way up into 2020, we've had over 53 community meetings and briefings. Most recently, we presented the environmental assessment back in January of 2020. And we hosted drop-in sessions in South Lake Union, East Lake, and the University District and Roosevelt neighborhoods. So I'd like to give you a little bit of the project history and key decisions along the way that have brought us to this point today. Back through 2014 through 2016, there's the development of the transit master plan and a bike master plan. Through that process, that really identified the Rapid Ride Roosevelt project, including the Bus Rapid Transit project. And it was included in the voter approved levy to move Seattle. So that really gave us the, the start to this being a project. In 2017, there's a locally preferred alternative developed for the project. And that's where the terminus, the northern terminus, was identified as the Roosevelt Link Station. In 2018, reached out to the community, I identified within the East Lake um, neighborhood, we identified the protected bike lane, and we did an evaluation of nine different bicycle routes to determine if there are any options um, that best met the evaluation criteria. That was to ensure that we were making the right decision to put the protected bike lanes on East Lake Avenue East. Also in 2018, it was identified that the best path forward was to do full paving replacement on East Lake Avenue East, and that was included in the project. All that culminated within the environmental assessment that we prepared and provided to the Federal Transit Administration, the FTA, back in January of this year. Obviously, a lot has happened in 2020 since then. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, that's brought us today to where we are proposing and moving forward with the shortened alignment with the J-Line terminating at the U-District Link light rail station. So now I'd like to go into a little bit more details on that updated route alignment. 
So why are we shortening the route? Well, shortening the route helps to address some of the budget shortfalls due to COVID-19. We identified King County Metro's updated budget doesn't have the capital funds. So for example, the money they were planning to contribute to building the project or the operational capacity, which includes resources like the buses and the drivers to operate the route. If the route were to continue up to the Roosevelt Link light rail station. With the levy to move Seattle funds and other grants we are seeking for the project, we wanted to make sure we maintain the improvements to transit speed, reliability, safety, and connections for the neighborhoods along the route, including Belltown, South Lake Union, East Lake, and the University District that this project was originally planned to provide. We feel comfortable shortening the Rapid Ride J line since there are strong transit alternatives within the Roosevelt neighborhood that connect to the J-Line at the University District Link Light Rail Station. These transit options include both the Link Light Rail and other local bus routes that will be revised as part of King County Metro's North Link restructure in 2021. Our original plans for the Rapid Ride J-Line route were to come from the South Lake Union and East Lake neighborhoods across the University Bridge and continue up to the Roosevelt Link Station. Our shortened alignment will now end at the University District Station. So we've coordinated with the North Link Connections Mobility Project, and that's basically the realignment of the bus routes to better serve and provide connections to the Link Light Rail when it opens in September of 2021. In particular, we looked at the local connections between the U District and the Roosevelt stations and identified Metro routes 45, 67, and 73 will all provide connections from the J-Line to serve the local neighborhoods along this route. In addition, with the J-Line connecting to the U District station, there are several transfer opportunities to better connect to the UW campus. With the planned routes and services, the J-Line will still provide transit connections between the Eastlake and South Lake Union neighborhoods to the Roosevelt neighborhood and the U-District. So how do we make the selection for this shortened route and where it would serve? took a lot of things into consideration. We wanted to make sure it was consistent with the community expectations that we had already set out and we had received over the last several years. We also wanted to ensure that it maintains the grant funding for the project. That's really necessary to keep this project moving forward to make sure that we were utilizing leverage of the local funds that were committed to this project to deliver on all the benefits we're looking for. We also wanted to make it forward compatible by keeping this option open to, the ex to extend it up to the Roosevelt Link Light Rail Station in future years if the resources were available to do that. With those considerations in mind, we revised the J-Line to end at the University District Link Station. The route that it would follow would be the same south of the University Bridge. Coming north of the bridge, the northbound route would follow 11th Avenue as it was in the original J-Line project plans, but it would turn east onto Northeast 43rd Street. The last stop would be located at 12th Avenue and Northeast 43rd Street. That would put passengers about one block away from the U District Link Station that's going to open in 2021. From there, the J-Line route would lay over along 12th Avenue. That's just when the buses transition and stop between their northbound service and southbound service. The first southbound stop would be located up at Northeast 45th Street at about University Way. It's up here. For the southbound service, it would then come south on 15th Avenue 
and west over to Brooklyn Avenue, where there would be a station located immediately adjacent to the Link Station. That would make transfers very convenient coming from Link Station and then connecting to the J Line and then coming down to the neighborhoods, including East Lake and South Lake Union. So that route would continue west on 43rd and then south on Roosevelt Way, again following the original alignment of the J Line on Roosevelt and continuing south to East Lake. The project would also include upgrades to support the additional buses. So on Northeast 43rd Street between Roosevelt Way and 12th Avenue, we'd be looking at paving that portion and we would also be implementing protected bike lanes to connect to the bike network that would be installed. Might be aware, especially right now, there's already some construction going on on 43rd uh, between 15th and Brooklyn. So that project is under construction. And there's also paving plan between Brooklyn and 12th and along 12th between 43rd and 45th. So those projects are all planned to be completed prior to the U District Link Station opening, and that's to um, promote and provide for other bus services. In addition, since this will be a trolley route, all of the trolley wires that need to be installed serving around that loop would be constructed um, prior to 2021, so well in advance of this project. So this will be taking advantage of the infrastructure that's already being implemented. With the shortened alignment and not going all the way up to Roosevelt, we did look at what the service connections could be to make sure that the, the Roosevelt neighborhood is still taken into consideration for this project. So next steps for the project. Our next steps for the project include collaboration with community members and businesses that might be impacted by the shortened alignment north of the University Bridge. We'll also be doing analysis that will be part of a supplemental environmental assessment. That supplemental EA will be provided to the Federal Transit Administration for their review, and then it will be published, and there will be a 30-day public comment period sometime in 2021. We'll certainly let everyone know prior to the publication of that. From there, the Supplemental Environmental Assessment, along with the original EA, will be reviewed by the FTA and any of the comments that have been received. And then the FTA will make an environmental determination. We will also be looking to secure the grant funding for the project, including the FTA Small Starts Grant, and we'll be providing an updated application along that when we submit the Supplemental Environmental Assessment. Hi, all of our panelists are going to turn their screens on shortly and respond to questions that you have been submitting through the Q&A function. You can continue to submit questions and we will do our best to get to all of them. We can collect those questions. If we don't reach a time when we can answer them all tonight, we can collect them and we can post them on our website in the coming days. So if we don't get to any questions, if we start getting a lot of them and we can't get through all of them, you will be able to find all the answers online in the coming days on our project website. But for now, our panelists are going to be turning on their cameras so that we can see who's here tonight. And Marielle, who you should already be able to see, will start to pose questions to our panelists. Now, as a reminder, you can continue to ask questions through our Q&A function. So if you were to move your cursor in your menu bar, you'll see speech bubbles with Q&A in them. If you were to click on that, you can type your questions to the panelists and they will be able to respond to those questions uh, in real time shortly. So I think we're ready to start addressing those uh, Q&A questions, Marielle. So I'll turn it over to you and we'll take it from there. Sounds good. 
I think to start looking at the questions, Garth, for you, if you can speak to when the rapid ride J line is coming in terms of both when construction is anticipated and when service itself will plan is planned to start. Sure. So right now we're looking at um, with our construction, we have to go through a couple steps first before we can get there. And right now we're at preliminary design and we're going through the environmental process. So we need to get all those approvals in place and then complete the final design. With that, we're targeting about the start of 2023 for construction. And we're looking at construction continuing through 2025 with start of service targeted for 2026. Great, thank you, Garth. The next question is talking about whether routing um, was considered, and Garth, I'll direct this to you as well, um, considered to terminate at Husky Stadium to provide better connections to the UW Hospital. So this route actually was identified, um, as we mentioned back kind of in 2015, and the alignment going up to Roosevelt um, was really what was in place for that. So we haven't looked at going out to Husky Stadium or going any further east. And part of that is just the, the operation of the line. The longer a line would go out, the more likely that we would have delays and, and the service wouldn't be at the quality level that would be needed. I don't know if there's anyone from uh, Metro would like to expand on that. Maybe we can come back to it if they're not quite ready to respond on it. I think we'll keep that moving. And if King County Metro folks want to add anything further, please feel free to chime in. Uh, our next question, Garth, is what upgrades are proposed on Northeast 43rd Street in terms of things like paving and bus bulbs? Um, and particularly, would there be any friction and safety issues between bus and people who are cycling? So great questions. There's actually a lot of activity on 43rd. Uh, for those that are in that vicinity right now, there's a current construction project that's doing some repaving, uh, plus all the work associated right in the vicinity of the station itself. There is, act, and I think um, some of those projects are targeted to really be opening up around March. Um, we also though have another paving project that's on 11th, I think it's on 11th, or sorry, 12th, I keep getting those um, backwards there, on 12th and 43rd, that's a little bit west of the project. So that's uh, targeted to start construction next year. All of that activity, so everything on 43rd from 12th to the east is planned to be opening concurrent or ahead of the link station opening. So when we come with our J-Line project, we'd really be looking at uh, from 12th Avenue uh, west to Roosevelt. So those couple blocks there would be part of our project. So everything east of there, there's actually protected bike lanes that are being planned as part of the project. And there's also, um, I think, from Brooklyn East to 15th Avenue, it's just going to be one way westbound for traffic. So there's going to be a lot less uh, traffic on 43rd. So for our project, we would be extending those protected bike lanes over to Roosevelt to make sure we can connect them to the protected bike lanes on Roosevelt itself, as well as uh, going south from there. So our project would also be putting in a northbound protected bike lane on 11th from the University of Bridge up to 43rd. So you would have a complete bike network through there. So kind of, I guess, getting back to it, one of the, the safety aspects of that um, with all those improvements and the limited amount of uh, vehicles that are going through there, it'll be a, a really comfortable area for bicyclists and pedestrians on 43rd. Great, thank you, Garth. And along the lines of kind of that area near 43rd, 43rd and the station, we have a question around why won't bus service go all the way to the Link Light Rail Station when going northbound? So if you can speak to some of the considerations around that station location. Yeah, and for that, if it's possible, I'll start talking to it. But if you're able to pull up uh, that slide, I'm looking to see which one it was. Slide 13.
So for northbound or outbound service from Seattle, um, the last stop we're proposing at 11th, or sorry, closer to 12th and uh, 43rd intersection, that puts it about one block away from the link station. And if you've been out in that, that area, it's actually really good visibility from that last stop. And we just kind of talked about some of the improvements that are going to go on on 43rd. So it's going to be a really um, good pedestrian friendly environment. The route from there needs to lay over before it goes southbound. And it's also a trolley route that we're putting in. And so there's kind of limited movements and we want to make sure we're not doing extra circulation around everything. So that gets it within one block. Um, but then we need to continue north up on 12th for the layover, which is where it transitions before it goes southbound. Coming southbound, we'd actually end up going west on 43rd. And so we are able to get um, curbside essentially to the U District Link Station. So for northbound, we'd be up about one block away. For southbound, we would be immediately adjacent to the station. Hey, Garth, uh, this is Jerry Robertson from King County Metro. Um, if possible, I'd like to expound on that just a little bit. I, th I think the question deserves uh, maybe a little more explanation um, from a transit operations standpoint. Um, if because our layover location on 12th between 43rd and 45th is pretty set, I mean, we don't have any other locations in this vicinity where we can easily access layover and have a place for the buses to park in between their trips and a place for uh, our drivers to have an opportunity to rest, go to the bathroom and things that they need to do at the end of their trip. We really needed to be able to access this layover on 12th Avenue. Therefore, if we were to provide direct access to the U District Link Station, right there at the same block rather than one block away, it would have required us to do what we've been referring to as a double looping scenario, meaning that we would have to go around the 12th, 45th, 15th, 43rd loop twice, once to access uh, the station, then to lay over, and then once again uh, to start the inbound trip. That's doable, but at a cost. And so the project team really looked at uh, um, the, uh, the cost benefit of doing that and realized that in order to do all that extra looping, it would really cut into our regular service availability. We have only a certain amount of money uh, dedicated for operations for this route. And for every extra few blocks that we operate this route, that means operations has to come from something else. So um, in order to provide a double looping scenario would mean that we provide less frequent service or a, less, a lesser time span uh, that our service would be available. It would have to come from somewhere. So we had to weigh that and finally came to the conclusion that the best case scenario here is to not do, not spend all that extra time looping but rather require the, uh, our passengers to have to walk that one block. Uh, as Garth said though, from that intersection of 43rd and 12th, great visibility to the station, just one block away with wayfinding signage and with um, um, you know, safety measures and everything that we take into consideration, making that one block connection um, is something that we felt was um, uh, the more palatable um, option rather than having to cut service here and there just to provide a double looping scenario. So um, that's a lot of words to say that uh, we uh, believe that this one block connection from that last stop to the uh, station um, is the better scenario here rather than double looping on every trip. Thank you, Jerry. And just as we're looking at some of these other questions, um, I've seen a couple pop up asking about why not use the existing pathway of Route 70 um, to reach the University District Link Light Rail Station via Northeast Campus Parkway, 15th Ave Northeast and Northeast 43rd Street. And I know there are a couple of thoughts here. Garth, do you want to start 
with that one and Jerry, feel free to chime in as well. And I think there's a slide that helps show this a little bit too in the, it, it wasn't within the presentation, but it shows the new routing that will be for Route 70 um, when the link station opens. I'm trying to see that slide 20, it looks like there. I guess it doesn't have them side by side, but it might help to discuss that a little bit. Thank you. So I, I think this is the route that you're kind of referring to. And I think just to kind of start and set the stage for everybody, um, with the link opening, it's already planned that the Route 70 will actually come and loop around the U District Link Station, but it would still be serving along Campus Parkway and 15th. One of the big concerns with that routing um, was how congested based on other buses and other um, movements that are going on through there, plus the amount of turns that it takes. By staying on 11th going north and then coming south on Roosevelt, it's, it's less congested and less turns, so that makes it more reliable for the transit service. The other thing, um, and it certainly was a consideration as we, as we looked at the shortened alignment, we're still looking at providing kind of that long-term vision of where the route could go. And while we don't have any current projects that would take it up to 65th and continue on, um, by putting all the infrastructure on 11th and Roosevelt as part of our project, um, it allows for that forward compatibility should we, should we extend the line in the future. So I think those are a couple of the key points and I certainly would let Jerry um, address, address that further. Uh, yes, uh, just to uh, reiterate, uh, I think what was mentioned earlier, the number of scenarios that we looked at um, for this vicinity, um, we realized that there had to be um, um, some uh, vision towards uh, what this, how this route could best serve the entire vicinity. Um, there are uh, other routes that serve this uh, western edge of the University of Washington campus. There are other routes in the vicinity. And this really, this one was a high contender. Um, but at the end of the day, we had to look at the service um, hours available and how much frequency we could provide with a, a slightly shorter alignment. Um, that was one of the key considerations that led us more to staying on the 11th and Roosevelt couplet for both in, inbound and outbound bus movements. Um, once we are at the U District Station, we are within uh, ease of walking distance uh, to the campus and to some other uh, vicinity um, destinations. Granted, we don't get quite as close to maybe some of the destinations there at 15th and Campus Parkway but there are other routes that uh, uh, serve those areas as well that connect directly to the, the J line um, if needed for that connection. Great, thank you, Jerry. Daryl, I'm gonna send this one your way. Um, we have a couple of questions about the protected bike lanes on East Lake at East and whether or not those are moving forward or impacted by any of the budget changes. Yeah, I guess to reiterate, there are no changes to the project south of the University Bridge. And tonight we're really discussing uh, changes above the University Bridge that have come about because of this um, shortened alignment. Uh, so there are no changes. The, the bike lanes are still going to be built as part of our projects. And the additional bike, play, uh, bike lanes that are a separate project, which you can read about, are, are linked from our project webpage are still being built uh, south of the Fairview Bridge. So yes, uh, all as far as we know right now, all of the protected bike lanes are still going to be constructed as part of this project. Great, thank you. And another question for you, Daryl, which is, will the name of the project be changed from the Roosevelt line to something else? Well, right now we're calling it the uh, J-Line, the Rapid Ride J-Line, and I imagine that's how it will be known in the future. So we have 
kept using Roosevelt just because that's part of the process right now, but at the end, it will be the uh, G-Line that it is known as. And it, I'll, I'll just add to that a little bit. One of the things that we're trying to do, because we know it's gone through a couple different names, um, because we do have a lot of the uh, NEPA, the National Environmental Protection Agency, if I get that acronym correct, Joel, um, since we're going through that process and we have the, the name as Rapid Ride Roosevelt and a lot of that documentation, we're trying to still use that. And um, so there is consistency across those documents. Essentially, once we get through that environmental process, then you'll you'll probably see things all switch to, to just referring to this as the J-Line project. So we're kind of going through that transition. Great, thank you, Garth. Jerry, this one's for you, which is, will we be updating any of the bus stops in the U District? Uh, yes, the the bus stops that you see on the map that's showing right now, uh, uh, either existing bus stops or or uh, if they are new locations, those are the locations of what we are calling our rapid ride stations. Uh, they have more amenities than a standard bus stop. They are branded with uh, rapid ride colors in in some fashion, and I, I'll get to a little more detail in that. Um, these, these station locations that you see um, there on uh, at the, the bottom of where Roosevelt and 11th come together uh, just uh, at Northeast Campus uh, way, that uh, those will be should be standard uh, rapid ride stations with all the amenities. Same goes for the station you see southbound on Roosevelt at 42nd, I think that is. Uh, the the uh, icon that you see on the map uh, called last northbound stop at on 43rd at 12th, that is uh, a stop only for exiting the bus, or as we in the transit industry say, alighting the bus. And because people are simply exiting the bus to get to their destinations, whether that is the U District Station or other destinations in the vicinity, uh, likely that would just be a sign indicating that this is where the bus stops and this is where people are getting off the bus. There would be no boarding the bus at that location, therefore likely no amenities. Uh, the first southbound stop that you see on 45th uh, between University Way and Brooklyn, that is an existing stop. Um, if you're familiar with using that stop for, for several bus, bus routes that use that stop, you know that it's a little bit of a constrained right of way. There's not a lot of room on that sidewalk area. Conveniently, the adjacent building does have an overhang that does protect our, pas our passengers uh, from weather. Um, we're not guaranteed that that building will always be there or that overhang will always be there, but for the foreseeable future, because of the limited right of way, the limited amount of sidewalk we have there, it's quite possible that there may be limited uh, rapid ride station amenities at this location. Um, very likely there would be a rapid ride, the familiar rapid ride sign indicating that this is the rapid ride station. Uh, there would be real time information at, this, at that location. Uh, there could be some other branded elements. There's a possibility there may not be an actual uh, shelter there because of the limited space behind the curb on the sidewalk. But be again, because of that overhang of the adjacent building, there is weather protection. So that's something that we will have to study as a project team to see exactly what uh, rapid ride station amenities we can have at that location, what will fit at that location. The, uh, the next inbound stop or southbound stop, it's actually westbound that you see there is immediately adjacent to the U District Station. Uh, that is a stop that is being upgraded to include a few more nice amenities um, uh, when that station, that U District link station is complete that will serve a, a, uh, the Route 70. Um, and it'll serve the Route 70 for that period of time um, between when that station opens and uh, when J-Line goes into service. Because uh, the uh, LINK project is upgrading that entire portion of that block, they're the ones that are actually providing um, upgrades for that stop for Route 70. 
uh, whenever rapid ride uh, J line comes along, we will have to evaluate which of those upgrades are appropriate for a, for a rapid ride station. Where can we put the branding, the red branded elements of rapid ride at that stop to create a station? So those are some discussions that we will have to have between Metro, SDOT, and Sound Transit, um, who um, has that, that link facility. Um, so it's hard to say exactly what it will look like at that station as well, but that will indeed uh, see some upgrade. You'll see some upgrades sooner at that location um, for, for Route 70, and then further upgrades later on for the J-Line. Thank you. And this is kind of a follow on, Jerry, for you, which is specifically about the southbound bus island on Roosevelt Way Northeast at Northeast 42nd, and whether or not it will be lengthened um, from supporting a single bus at this time. Um, I may not be the best person to answer that. Uh, Garth, is that something that you have a little more expertise on? Sure. And actually, it's a question that we have within our design team right now. So we have a design consultant that's working with us um, to identify kind of what improvements might be needed there. So I don't have any definitive answers right now. These are kind of just shown as here's where we expect the, the stop to be and what we're expecting to utilize. Um, but we're, we're going to look at that further in terms of what the lengths are. Are there any improvements that could be made um, in particular to some of these stops where we have the protected bike lane um, adjacent, those are always things that we're, we're looking to improve on. So since that was not within the, uh, the stop approximately 42nd, I think it was the, the Roosevelt and 42nd. I want to make sure I'm referring to the right stop here. Was that, Mariel, is that correct that we were looking at? Yes. At the, the Roosevelt, okay. Um, so that, that particular location had not been included in our original design concepts. So right now, um, we would need to look at that a little bit further and, and we'll provide a little bit more information. Now, um, just for process purposes, that's probably something that will go into our final design, which would be after we, we get through this preliminary, we identify here's the general improvements that we're going to make, and then we'll advance into our, our final design process. And some of those details will, will get worked out through that process. Um, but the, the length of it is something that we'll probably at least identify and see if it needs to be lengthened um, through our initial design work. So more, more to come on that. Don't have all the answers yet. Thank you, Garth. Um, follow up question for you, Garth, which is how many additional parking spaces will be impacted by this project in the U District specifically? So we don't, that's another one that we don't have, but it is part of our supplemental environmental assessment um, process. And fortunately, um, we do actually have the data already collected as part of the original environmental assessment. So, so we know how many parking spaces are there. Um, one thing I would just kind of note as part of that is there are a lot of other projects as I had, had kind of laid out. There's at least three other projects right in that vicinity on 43rd. So those are all going to be an existing condition. So the focus will be on um, what additional parking impacts there might be within that vicinity. So that will be analyzed as part of the supplemental EA. So when we publish that, um, the data will be in there. Great, thank you. Our next question pertains to some of the other transit alternatives that exist in the area. And in particular about um, the, that it would be valuable to be able to see some of the routes and stops that are in the U District specifically. And so David, if you can pull up the slide for that, I think it is 13 maybe. There we go. And so um, Garth can speak to this in terms of kind of what we're showing here, but I'll just note that this is a particular subset of transit connections um, and that the North Link Connections Mobility Project also has a more extensive map of some of the planned infrastructure there. But Garth, I'll let you take it from there. 
Sure, and I, I definitely, uh, I'll acknowledge right away that I do not know every one of these routes, <laughs> but I did look through the North Link Mobility um, Project because some of them are being um, revised as part of the link opening. So what I've really identified um, on this slide is kind of the first step is Metro routes 45, 67, and 73. Those are ones that connect both to the U District station and the Roosevelt station. So recognizing that we're shortening the alignment, that's that was kind of the first um, look at some of the routes. Down at the bottom of the slide here, all these routes that are listed are ones that connect from the U District station and basically travel east along different paths and different routes um, towards UW. So um, the best thing to do is to kind of look, I think the North Link Connections project identifies which routes are remaining the same and which ones are being modified. Um, the other thing I would just note is there's service revisions and Metro can, can chime in on this one, but I'll, I'll, I'll speak on that behalf. There's service revisions that occur um, biannually every, every six months that go into effect. So these are these are currently what's planned, but as we move towards construction and with the opening of J-Line, minor revisions to these routes um, may occur and we'll be certainly looking at that in terms of making sure there's good connections between the, the J-Line and some of these other routes, whether it's at the, the link station or at, at points along the way. Um, and a good example of that is adding the stop on 45th for the southbound service was recognizing that we want to make those connections um, as seamless as, as possible. So I, Mary, I'll, I'll let you, if you could let me know whether I got to all the points in that question or if I need to elaborate. I think that was a good starting point. And if folks have follow up questions, please feel free to, to drop them in the, the Q&A. Um, the next one we'll touch on, Jerry, for you, which is how many buses per hour will be stopping along 43rd and at the U District Station? Um, that is a very good question. And this is where I'm glad that uh, we have someone from Metro Service Planning uh, Group with us tonight, and I think he can probably answer that a little bit better or give a better idea of a, a good answer for that better than I could. Uh, Dave Vanderzee is on the call. Dave, would you like to uh, take a stab at that question? Um, sure. So, uh, as far as the the total buses per hour, um, we can I can at least speak to at least what's here in the proposal for the J line. Um, and again, those kind of peak buses per hour, so they'll run more frequently during, during the peak periods and it will be a similar level of service to what is on uh, the Route 70 or proposed in the Route 70 today. So that does get all the way down to about six or seven minute um, frequency during the peak periods. So that translates to about eight to 10 buses per hour. Uh, so again, that is a, specifically for the J line and again, similar to the frequencies in the peak periods that are offered on uh, the, the Route 70 and proposed uh, in the North Link uh, service restructure as well. Great, thank you. Um, Garth, while we've got the transit connections up, um, we had a couple of questions around the access to the UW campus, um, which I think you spoke to, but just kind of tying that visually to this map here. Yeah, so the, the map that we have pulled up doesn't, um, I think it can shows just a few of the routes. It may not show all the ones that, that we have listed. Certainly those connections um, is part of what we wanna make sure uh, works with the project. The other part is just making sure that we're within a, a fairly close proximity to the campus so that there's options. So there's certainly going to be people that will just be able to walk depending on where they're going. There's also going to be, I guess it's good to note at the U District link station, there's also going to be a bike storage facility. So there's going to be opportunities to, to switch from transit to bikes to connect to the rest of campus. So there's multiple, multiple options and ways to get around. Uh, one of the 
the challenge is making sure that transit is is reliable and accessible is keeping the routes short enough so they can stay on time um, and people can rely on them being there when it's expected and so if the routes start going too far that becomes a something that's just unmanageable and that's what we're trying to avoid and address within some of the improvements that we're doing so that's why sometimes a connection is is necessary um, and Jerry, I'd certainly let you elaborate if you know any, or if maybe if Dave Andersey knows any of the routes that are planned a little bit better for those connections to through campus. I'll defer to Dave on that if he has uh, a good answer to supplement that. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, Garth, I think you've got a, a pretty good set of routes here uh, on this uh, slide. Um, and again, uh, mul multiple of these routes will have, uh, put, you know, some shared stops with the J line. So, um, you know, if you are um, making a connection from the J line at the U District Station, um, you know, certainly the Route 372 uh, is a, you know, a very frequent route that operates through campus, um, and we know that a lot of folks use that route today as. Um, as just a way to get to that sort of last mile through campus. We expect that um, to kind of use to get uh, pattern to continue in the future. Um, so under the Northlink Connections Mobility Project, also the Route 372 would um, use those new stops, the new stop on uh, Northeast 43rd in front of the station. And again, the uh, new stop on Northeast 45th. So again, those will be stops that are, uh, you know, shared. Uh, by the, the J-Line alignment as proposed here. So uh, again, making it sort of a, a pretty seamless transfer. Um, and again, there are some other examples there. I, again, I call it the 372 because that does provide a pretty direct connection through campus and a frequent connection uh, that it operates on today, but we'll also have some revisions as part of Northlink that will share those same stops uh, proposed for the J-Line. Great, thank you both. Garth, this next question is for you, which is, will this project require additional construction on the streets around the U District light rail station? And just elaborating further there. Sure, that was definitely a, a factor in terms of where we put the route. We wanted to make sure we didn't come in on top of all the other construction and redo things that were just implemented. So taking advantage of all that infrastructure. Um, I mentioned a couple of the projects that there's the 12th Avenue paving that's actually planned to start um, early next year that will be between 43rd and 45th. So that will already be constructed. So where we're putting the layover, that's already going to be done. And all of the paving on 43rd and the improvements on 43rd between 12th and uh, 15th, so east um, of 12th, will already be constructed. So on 43rd itself, between Roosevelt and 12th, we are looking with additional buses, we are looking at um, replacing the paving. There was consideration, but not budget available to do some of that work ahead of the link opening. Um, but since that was not available and wasn't really needed unless the buses were traveling there, um, that work is now part of our project. So that will be the most, um, I guess, impactful construction. The other thing and the other part of the project is the OCS, the overhead cantonary system, which is basically what supports the trolley wire, since this is a, a trolley route. So we will need to put in the poles associated with that. Um, again, everything east of 12th, all the way around the, the station and those few blocks, that will already be in place. Um, but west of 12th over to Roosevelt, those two blocks, will also need the OCS and trolley wire. We also would be looking at traffic signal uh, modifications. And this would also be addressing, um, I guess at 12th, I wanna make sure I get the streets right here, <laughs> on 11th, sorry, 11th and 43rd, there's an existing signal. We will need to be making modifications to that signal to support the trolley wire, um, other ADA ramps and other elements that we're putting in. Um, plus, we'll look and see what we need to do for the uh, protected bike lane going in and potentially have a, have a dedicated uh, phase for the, the bikes going through that intersection. So there'll be improvements to that signal. 
And then just going one block over on 43rd and Roosevelt, currently that intersection is not signalized. And we're considering uh, whether that needs to be signalized or not um, to allow for the buses to make the left turn from 43rd South onto Roosevelt. So that's uh, not a certainty right now, but it's something that we're looking at through the preliminary design um, to see if that signal needs to be included. And I think the question was, was specifically along what improvements on 43rd. So I think I've captured those. Yes, thank you. Um, this next question, Michelle, is for you, which is, will operation of this line come with increased fare enforcement along the route compared to Route 70? Yeah, so um, most of the time our rapid road routes do come with more fare enforcement than um, routes like Route 170. That being said, um, as some of you may have seen as part of the King County Executive's budget, Metro is looking at the relationship and future of enforcement and policing. And those conversations will actually be taking place in the next coming, in sort of the next few months um, into parts of next year. Um, and so once Rapid Ride J line actually launches, um, that could potentially look a little bit different. So I don't have a straight answer um, for that question right now. Great, thank you. Um, Garth, can you speak to this question of 11th Ave uh, PBL and if that'll be on the left or the right side. Sure. So as part of the original project that was planned to go all the way up to Roosevelt, we'd actually looked at the 43rd intersection as being one that we might shift from the PBL being on the right side to being on the left side. So for for our project right now that we're looking at just going from 43rd south to the University Bridge, we are looking at putting the PBL on 11th and it would be on the right side as currently shown in the concept drawings. At the intersection of 43rd, whether we transition that um, to the left side or not will really depend on if we're going to extend that PBL further north than 43rd and a decision on that has not been made yet. So we'll, we'll look at that and see what options there are as we progress through final design. But certainly up to 43rd, the PBL is planned to be on the, on the right side. Um, it may be worth for, for those that are not as familiar with that, the PBL, the protected bike lane. Um, one of the reasons for considering it on the left side is with 11th being a one-way street, by having the PBL on the left side, it reduces the conflicts between the buses that are pulling in and out of the stops and the bikes. So we have a design manual that's called Streets Illustrated that gives guidance when we have a frequent transit route. Um, generally, we try and put the protected bike lane on the left side of a one-way street to, to minimize those conflicts. Um, but here, because 11th is transitioning off of the University Bridge, where the bike lane is already on the right side, uh, it would require to get to the left side it would require a transition somewhere. So that's that's kind of the background to it. Um, but again, since the, the shortened J-Line route is going to end at 43rd, the PBL that would be going in as part of this project would be on the right side up to that point. Great, thank you. Another question for you, Garth, which is about the location of a rapid ride station um, in East Lake, specifically between Boston and Lynn Street on the northbound side of East Lake, and whether or not that's been re relocated closer to the intersection uh, versus the midpoint. Garth, you're muted. We're pretty good that this is the first time. <laughs> um, slide 28, if you could pull that up for me. So this is the, the East Lake area. And I know for this meeting, the, the focus isn't as much on East Lake because we aren't um, planning really revisions there. Um, but the stop that I think is being asked about, um, was that Lynn? I want to make sure I'm referring to the right cross street. I see, I see Daryl nodding, so that's it. <laughs> Lynn. Lynn and Boston, yes. yes. 
Very good. So on this figure, it's it's right where the I-5 symbol is. That's where we're looking at for Lynn. And that northbound stop, especially with uh, Lynn being kind of a connection over to I-5, um, we've gotten a few comments about where this stop would be best located. And there's a lot of constraints there, especially with businesses and driveways through that area. So it has been brought to our attention um, to consider moving the stop a little bit further south. It would still be within the same block. That is something that as we advance the design, it's still um, being considered since we've now kind of delayed our, our final design work because we have to look at the short alignment. Um, we, we haven't advanced that, but it is absolutely something that our uh, design consultants are looking at and are going to evaluate to see if that stop can be moved um, further south. There's lots of considerations in terms of how close the bus stops are, how well um, pedestrians can cross and riders can cross from one side to the other. So those are all, all factors that go into that, um, but it is still being considered. Thank you. And while we are on the topic of East Lake, um, a couple of questions along those lines. Uh, the first is, will East Lake be repaved in advance of the project? And if so, when? So we've actually looked at, uh, it really would be best to do all of the work together as this project has kind of been, been delayed a little bit. We certainly have, have considered, would it make sense to come in and do the paving ahead? Um, right now, it's still, there are so many things that are integrated between what we would be putting in as part of the paving project and the transit elements, such as the stations, that it doesn't really make sense for us to try and do that paving project first. We also would be looking at what would be the impacts and coming in and trying to do a paving project and then have a, a lag in between before we come back in and do this project would probably have more impact to the neighborhood and the businesses. Um, so we really feel it's best to do all of that work together. Um, we recognize that that it's it's quite a bit of work going on through there. There's another element, which is the water main. So the, the goal is always, um, I hear this with our coordination group all the time, the goal is to do the deepest work first. And so that really starts with with the water main work and then the paving and then the, then the transit. And so it, it would kind of be done in that sequence, but the more that we can do that together and overlap that work, the least impactful overall that would be. So that's that's our current plan. Thank you, Garth. Um, also a question for you to start with, Garth, um, which is related to the interactions between people who are riding transit and people who are biking at the stations in particular, um, and notably with the design of the stations along East Lake Ave. So yeah, each area might be a little bit different, but um, in particular along East Lake, our proposed cross section I don't know if there if there's a figure that actually shows the cross section. Maybe we can pull that up. But the proposed cross section has um, the protected bike lanes with a with a buffer, and the protected bike lanes are on either curb line. Um, so yeah, we're looking at the top portion there of the typical section. So this this isn't showing where a station would be. Um, the interface then for the stations. There's a lot of there's always a lot of questions of what's going to work best. What we found is putting the protected bike lane so that um, it really goes behind where the station is. So what's labeled there right now is a three foot buffer that's in between the regular vehicle travel lane and that bike lane. Essentially, when we get to a transit station, we would be widening that out and shifting that bike lane over um, and so that people would have a place to to wait for the bus and that's where the shelter and all the amenities would be and the bikes would be going behind that. Um, I, th I think in the designs we, we typically also would then be looking at raising the bike lane so it's at curb level. A lot of these details we haven't finalized. Um, this is an area where the engineering really looks at a lot of different options and it's it's an area that's actually advancing and we're saying well what's the safest way to do it um, but i think that's kind of the current practice is we'd probably be raising the bike lane so the the bicyclists would be slowing down um, and then we would have the actual bus stop and the shelter facilities 
between the bike lane and the drive lane. And that way the, the buses, when they come, they wouldn't be crossing the bike lane. That's one of the, the key features of that. The buses wouldn't be crossing over the bike lane to be able to pick up, to be picking up passengers. So we, we think that's the safest and the most efficient for both. Great. And a, a follow-up clarification on that is, would the PBL reduce the width of the sidewalk? So the protected bike lane have any impact on sidewalk width? I don't know that I have that level of detail. Um, I'm trying to see. And I think there, I think on East Lake it might, I, a lot of times there's also, and you can kind of see in these figures, there's also um, utilities and trees that go in between the sidewalk and the curb. So sometimes we wouldn't have to sh uh, narrow the sidewalk itself down. I don't think we're ever in that situation. Um, we, But we might have to go into areas where there's kind of that, um, that area between the curb and the sidewalk itself that we may need to take the bike lane into that. I don't have a, a detail of that, um, but that's what I'm envisioning that we have in our preliminary concept plans. Thanks. This next question is for Jerry, um, and this is going back up into the U District in terms of station locations. And the question is, why not shift the eastbound stop on Northeast 45th Street to the west, closer to the link station? That is a very good question, and I should have elaborated on that uh, earlier when I was talking about 45th. Um, Shifting that stop to the west a little bit, closer to uh, Brooklyn, uh, that would be a little uh, easier or a little closer connection to the link station. That's something we'll look at. Um, it's not a done deal that that station will remain where the current stop is just west of uh, University Way. Uh, so uh, in order to do that, we would have to uh, start some discussions with adjacent property owners in that uh, case, there is, uh, as you know, there is a large uh, theater and other tenants in that building that we would need to engage. We have not done that. Uh, but if we, in our technical analysis, found that moving that station to the uh, uh, east is something that would be a, vi I'm sorry, to the west would be a viable option, then that's something that we would have to start some discussions with um, um, other uh, folks in that vicinity to see how well that would work. At the very least, we know we have the current stop where it is there just west of University Way. But yes, if we do find that we can, from a technical and operational standpoint, perform better and serve our customers better by moving it a little bit more to the west, closer to the link station, um, then that's something that uh, we would definitely evaluate. Um, but there are definitely a lot of uh, a lot of considerations for moving an existing stop like that to a new location, because uh, this would not be just a stop for uh, rapid ride J line. It would be a stop that would serve all the, the routes that run on 45th. So we have to take that into consideration. Great, thank you. Um, Gareth, for this next question, can you speak to how the the last northbound station location and some of the improvements along Northeast 43rd Street will um, support accessibility for people with different abilities? Yeah, and I, and I think I've mentioned a, a few times as far as uh, the projects going on east of 12th Avenue. Um, on 43rd, there's going to be a lot of pedestrian improvements there. And actually, the intersection of 12th and 43rd itself, um, all of the ADA ramps at that intersection are already going to be planned for um, making those current to current standards as part of the project that's going to be constructed in 2021. Um, so coming west of there at each of the intersections that we go through, um, because we are doing a paving project, each intersection, we are also going to look at uh, making sure those ramps are brought up to current standards. Um, and that would include the intersection of um, Roosevelt Way and 43rd as well. So 
also as part of the paving, we'll look to see what the conditions of all the sidewalks are um, to see if any of those upgrades need to be made at the time, at the same time. So we don't have a, a full conditions, um, or existing conditions detailed out for that, but it is part of what we consider as we advance the design. Um, I think the other part that I mentioned, the signal at 43rd and Roosevelt, another reason for that, I think I had mentioned before, um, one of the factors is for the, the buses to be able to make the left turn to go from westbound 43rd to southbound Roosevelt. A signal there could also be uh, utilized for pedestrian safety as well. So those are, those are factors that'll come in there. I know there's a lot of pedestrian crossings already on Roosevelt with lots of other improvements that have been made per previous projects, um, but a signal is also one that would be considered. So we definitely wanna make sure that, that all the routes to these stops that we're putting in are going to be, be accessible. And in particular, um, getting from, from that last northbound stop to the U District Station. Um, as I mentioned though, a lot of that improvement's already gonna be in place prior to our project. Thanks, and I'm seeing um, from some of our technical team as well uh, that lighting is something uh, in terms of safety that will be a big focus around the, the station as well. In terms of our next question, Jerry, we have a follow-up, which is for the station that you were talking about and that shift west, if that falls into consideration with the Route 44 project and the other 2021 upgrades, or if it is truly driven by Rapid Ride J-Line in terms of that location and kind of the timing of that decision. Um, I don't know if I have an ideal answer for that question. I, I think ultimately, just like all of our stations, um, all of our station locations, ultimately we want them to be at the best locations that serve our customers. Um, beyond that is when we start looking at things from more of a technical and operational standpoint you know, can we serve our customers the best way at that station location and still uh, operate our buses safely um, and the way that we're supposed to operate them um, and still be able to make all of our bus movements. Um, so there are a lot of factors that go into that. Yes, looking at other projects in the area, whether they are transit upgrade projects uh, or other uh, adjacent construction projects, those do have a bearing. And we definitely don't want to be in a situation where we are um, upgrading something that we could have planned to and, and upgraded earlier from a, a prior um, uh, project effort. Um, at the same time, um, there are a lot of moving parts in this entire vicinity. So I I don't necessarily have the, the perfect answer to that question other than um, I think ultimately having stations at the best locations that serve our customers and can perform well operationally with our bus operations is, is paramount. And then underneath that is when we look at other projects and how we can coordinate with those other projects in order to create the best efficiency possible. I welcome uh, Garth or Dave to uh, elaborate more if you have something better to elaborate on that. I think the only part I'd add, just the, the route, I think there was a question about the Route 44 mm -hmm. um, improvements within there. And that's something that we're, we're definitely in, uh, coordinating with. So not um, just regarding the station, but also the channelization improvements that are going on as part of that. Um, those are definitely independent of the project that we're doing here, but we would be reflecting all of those again, kind of as an existing condition and they, they do help contribute. So there are um, protected or sorry, they are uh, dedicated uh, transit lanes that are going in on 45th and 15th. And so that's, that's going to be a benefit to the J line, but it's not uh, directly um, 
for our project, but that project would be done in advance of the JLine project. Great, our next question, Garth, is that noting that there will be impacts on parallel parking on East Lake as East, and what are some of the ways that SDOT and the project are planning to um, mitigate those impacts? So, yeah, our focus again on, on this um, presentation has really been within the U District area. But East Lake, we have um, looked at the, the parking and we've done a lot of work on that. All of that is presented within the environmental assessment that was published in January of 2020. Um, we do have some mitigation strategies that are included in that. I would say one of the, the biggest focal points of that um, is really addressing the, the load zones to make sure that we can um, support the businesses that are along East Lake. And so realigning those um, load zones to side streets is something that we put a lot of focus on. That work will continue and all the mitigation strategies that we identified will continue through um, final design and in, in through construction. So all of that is still moving forward. Um, some of the other strategies, I don't know that I'm going to remember all four of them off the top of my head here. I haven't looked at them for a little while, um, but one of the other ones is about shared parking which would be utilizing um, parking garages that are currently underutilized in the area and seeing um, if there's opportunities to kind of connect different um, property owners and businesses with underutilized parking. So that's another um, focus area. I don't know if Joel, if you happen to recall the other um, two offhand, I wanna add anything to that. Hi, Garth. This is Joel Hancock from SDOT. Um, in the January 2020 uh, 20 environmental assessment, we also talked about the parking mitigation strategies, including the ones that we proposed in Eastlake. Um, and so Garth has already summarized those. Um, we are also considering updating the RPZ um, in Eastlake, and that would also happen during final design, in addition to relocating the low zones. Yeah, to, to, thanks for the reminder, Joel, there. The RPZ is Restricted Parking Zone. Um, I think it I think it can be used a couple different ways in terms of that acronym, but um, it's basically allowing residents to, to park. They have a permit that would allow them to park, but also opening up um, for businesses. So that is something that we would be advancing as well, is identifying um, how that currently is being utilized and if there's updates needed to that process um, that would be best used to balance the business and residential needs basically taking advantage of any any spaces that are currently out there and making sure that they're they're best utilized for the neighborhood thank you this next question is also for you, which is, will Rapid Ride J-Line have priority on crossing the University Bridge, or will boat traffic still be able to demand bridge opening and impact the transit schedule? So this is an area that's, that is covered within the transportation analysis within the environmental assessment. We did look at the, the bridge openings and the frequency of those openings to see if there was an impact to, to transit. Um, one thing to to definitely clarify is during the peak hours, I don't know them um, off the top of my head here, but the peak hours, there are not bridge openings allowed unless it's a vessel over a certain size that happens maybe once or twice a year. So when we have the, the highest demand on that bridge, um, there's already an agreement that, that the bridge um, openings won't occur. What we really looked at from there is during those off peak hours, um, because we do have the existing Route 70 going across the bridge, we looked to see based on existing service, um, how frequently the, the bus was impacted and essentially it made up for that difference by the time the, the bus continued along its route. So by providing, um, I think off peak, our frequencies are um, 
every 10, 10 minutes. Um, so one opening, I think lasts, I'm trying to remember some of these, I, I knew some of these numbers off the top of my head before, but I think the bridge opening is about two minutes. And so by the time it's open and closed, um, basically that can be recovered along the rest of the route. For northbound, we also um, have a transit only lane that's part of our um, design that's near the university bridge prior to, to getting on the bridge. And that um, could serve, especially if there is a, a backup on the bridge itself, that can serve as a little bit of a queue jump is the term that, that we share at times. Um, usually that's operating through a signal, but it would act kind of similarly in this case where the buses could kind of jump ahead a little bit of the other cars to, to make up some of that time. So it's definitely been considered, but essentially the impacts are, are very nominal to transit. And just to follow up with some numbers from our technical team there, those peak hours are 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. And the bridge opening typically takes up to 4.6 minutes. Th thanks. I, thanks, Joel. I was a little a little off in how long it, it opens, so it's a little bit longer than we expected. But. Great. Um, our next question um, is around the SDOT cycle tracks impact on South Main Street impacting the south terminal of Route 70 and how that has required the route to use South Jackson Street. Um, and curiosity about if this will impact Route 70 northbound reliability. I'm not sure if that's Route 70 or rapid right J line reliability, but I'll let our technical folks speak to that. So I'll, maybe I'll kick it off. And Jeff, I think you're on the line and you may have a little bit more um, answers related to that, or if Metro is able to, to fill in a little bit. Um, so our, our J line project doesn't propose any revisions to that south end. So that work, um, the way the Route 70 is going to operate will be the same as the J line would operate. I know we coordinated um, both in terms of where layover spaces are and in terms of the routing for Route 70 with those projects to try and um, balance all the needs down there. Um, but I, I don't have any of the specific details, but our project wouldn't be revising that. So Jeff or, um, Somebody from Metro, do you have further information on that? Right, this is Jeff Bender with SDOT. No, Garth, I think you described the situation perfectly. Uh, this is Jerry from Metro. I don't have anything to add to that answer. Great, thank you all. So we've also gotten some comments through the Q&A section, which we appreciate the, the feedback in those, and we'll certainly publish those as part of the meeting summary and, and work with those from there. At this point, we've gotten through the questions themselves. Um, unless there's anything that's kind of burning for the project team or any final questions that somebody wants to drop in. Um, if not, we can wrap up and let folks enjoy their evening. Um, we have one final question here I'm seeing, which is about how many folks attended the webinar. I think at peak, we had around 35 attendees. Garth, to close us out, do you just want to remind folks um, kind of next steps for the project one last time? And we'll leave it at that. Sure, I'd be glad to do that. Um, so really our next steps were, we basically have identified this shortened al alignment. Um, using a technical term, you may see that it's called the minimal operable segment. We didn't want to throw too many technical terms at you, um, but that's something in terms of the environmental process that we would be identifying. 
So we're doing some of the analysis and just on just enough of the preliminary design to get us to the point where we can identify um, any additional impacts um, that this shortened route would have. And those are going to be included in a supplemental EA, Supplemental Environmental Assessment. That Supplemental Environmental Assessment will be submitted to the FTA for review. So we work with them. It's actually being done um, kind of at their direction through the through the NEPA process that I mentioned before. After they've had a chance to review it, after FDA has reviewed it, we will publish it. Basically publishing it is, is jointly between FDA and SDOT. And we're looking at doing that. Um, I don't know if we have an exact time frame for that. I believe it's um, into spring of 2021. From there, the supplemental EA, um, which is just focused, again, just on this realignment, but done similarly to the impacts as shown within the overall EA that was published back in January. Both of those documents, um, or sorry, the supplemental EA will go for a public comment period similar to the EA that was published in January. So there'll, there'll be an opportunity for public comment on that document. All of those comments are then submitted through the FTA, Federal Transit Administration, and then the FTA will make an environmental determination. And that would determine if we're allowed to proceed with final design on the project. So that's kind of a key milestone for, for advancing the design work. And I think we've referenced it a few times that sometimes there's, um, sometimes there's design work that hasn't been done yet because we're only at a preliminary level. So that's really going to be the, the opportunity for us to, to advance and, and move into that final design. Um, so we will definitely have additional outreach opportunities along the way, both as part of the kind of rolling out the supplemental EA as well as advancing the final design. Um, through that, as, as the design is advanced, we're also seeking the FTA Small Starts grant. So that's a key feature to making sure that we have funding to be able to construct the project. So we're already in um, the process for that grant, but involves all these steps, one of them being the environmental, the next being making sure that we've advanced final design. So once we've got all those design components done, that's when we would be able to move into construction. So if we're looking at it, it's, uh, it's still 2020 now. The reason that the construction wouldn't be looking to start until um, I would say at the earliest into 2022, but more likely into 2023 is to allow us time to complete all those steps, secure the funding that's necessary, finish the design, and then we go into the construction. So that's our, uh, that's our status and that's where we're at. Um, hopefully we've addressed the questions. I'm hearing a few things pop up. I don't know if any additional questions have come in as I provided that summary. No, thank you for that recap. Um, I just know in all of the information, it can be easy to lose sight of the next steps, and, and especially as that timeline drives a lot of considerations for the Q&A. Q I appreciate you recentering that. Um, as Daryl mentioned at the beginning, we will post this recording to the project website. Um, we'll also post the, the questions with some elaboration. Um, and if you have additional comments or questions, you can always email the project at rapidride at seattle.gov. But thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you, everybody. Sorry, we couldn't be there in person, but hopefully you were able to get your questions answered tonight. Thanks for joining us.